Good evening, Christ Church. Welcome to Going Deeper. My name is Lindsay, and this is my husband, Andy, and we're going to be your hosts for this service tonight. We're going to enter into a time of worship, and if at any point you would like prayer, we would love to pray with you over here. If you want to pray on your own, you can pray over here, but we are praying for you. When you're over here, we're just over there. So um, Andy's going to pray for the service. Almighty God, thank you for tonight. Thank you for this time that we get to spend together going deeper into your word and having fellowship as a community. Thank you for this community of believers. Pray that you would bless us. Pray that you would put your hands of protection around all the students and teachers as they going back to school this week. And uh, we just ask your blessings on this time. Thank you for our worship team. Thank you for Reverend Shane. And pray that you would uh, help us to open our open our hearts to your word tonight. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Oh, 
Almighty 
fortress, my defense. Time and time and time again. Oh, time and time and time again. Oh, time and time and time again. And again and again. And again and again. feet upon that rock I'm standing on your goodness God you set my feet upon that rock I'm standing on your goodness God you set my feet upon that rock I'm standing on Put a new song in my mouth Gave me something to sing about Set my feet upon that rock I'm standing on your goodness You put a new song You put a new song in my mouth Gave me something to sing about Set my feet upon that rock I'm standing on your goodness You'll come through You'll come through now like you did back then Time and time and time again Almighty fortress, my defense Time and time and time glory we give you honor Lord we remind ourselves that the only reason we gather here tonight is for the name of Jesus 
continue to thank you and give you praise for the freedom we have to be here tonight. Thank you for bringing us here safely for this space. May we never take it for granted. Father, as we continue to sing, as we prepare to hear your word, may you continue to soften our hearts, slow us down, open our ears to hear you speak. Father, as we prepare to give our tithes and offerings, use them, bless them, to strengthen your church, to reach those who are searching for you. We love you. We give you praise through the name of Jesus. We say in agreement, amen. Hey, if you'd like to give tonight, there are some bowls in the front and the back. If you're watching online, there's a link for you there. Give as you feel led. Yeah. 
until you are all things you deserve the glory you deserve you deserve you are worthy of it all yes you are you are worthy of it all our God for from you are all things until
Amen, amen. Tonight, our scripture comes from Colossians 1, 1 through 2, and I'd love for you to read it with me. This letter is from Paul, chosen by the will of God to be an apostle of Christ Jesus and from our brother Timothy. We are writing to God's holy people in the city of Coloss, who are faithful brothers and sisters in Christ. May God, our Father, give you grace and peace. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Take a moment to say hello to one another. God is good all the time. We've got a full house tonight. We've got name tags tonight. So for all of those of you that talk to people each week and you almost knew their name, this was your big chance. Hopefully you've uh, put some names with some faces tonight. Welcome to everybody who joins us online and to our CM campus. One of the things I used to love to do when we spent a lot of time in the Smoky Mountains was go to the places where there were stores and you could buy things. But my favorite thing to buy were books that were written by people who lived in the mountains. I just liked hearing their stories. I liked hearing their perspectives. And these weren't books that were published by big publishers. These were local books. Uh, These were just things that came naturally from the people. I once bought a book that relayed harrowing accounts of search teams looking for lost people in the Smoky Mountains. It was really fascinating. Some of these people were rescued, and others were, frankly, discovered too late. The stories were interesting because of what they had in common. This various and sundry cadre of lost people almost all generally had good information to start. But at some point, they suffered a cataclysmic fail that rendered them officially lost. Have you ever hit the point where you know you're now officially lost? There's, I know where I'm going, I'm not sure where I'm going, I'm now lost, right? And there are times when being lost is no big deal at all. I was once going to Louisville, Kentucky. I ended up in Lexington. As it turned out, I had a marvelous time in Lexington. Didn't bother me at all. Other times, it can be a little bit problematic where you end up in some type of potentially perilous situation, a place you don't want to be at a time you wouldn't want to be there. There is a moment at which we are lost. And at that moment, things begin to happen inside of us. There is a condition of lost Generally speaking, these lost individuals either fail to properly follow standard safety protocol, or they didn't bring the right supplies, and most of all, they didn't prepare for changing weather. The weather got them. In some cases, all three sort of combined for a perfect storm. Now, We all know that when people are lost, a new murky reality emerges within us. I still remember when I was a kid, we were at a Kmart, flashing blue light Kmart. I remember something uh, caught my attention. I went to see it and I looked up and my mom and my sister weren't there. And I still remember the feeling that panicky feeling of being lost when I was a child. When you're lost, this new reality emerges that physically, emotionally, and psychologically impacts you. The most fascinating of these stories established that lostness causes disorientation. 
So if I can use some really bad English, the more lost you are, the more loster you get. And the longer you've been lost, disoriented you become. Do you know rescue teams in this book found people who had been frozen to death because they took all of their clothes off in a blizzard? They got that disoriented. They talked about finding other people who had been lost for some time despite the fact that they were hiding from the rescuers. Their paranoia had set in at such a massive level that they perceived the rescuers to be a danger to them. They were hiding from the people who came to save them. Lostness is its own gig, to be sure. When I finished the book, I marveled at how lostness affects us. And I also sort of marveled at how easy it is for humans to get lost and how difficult it is to rescue them. We're a hard lot to rescue. You ever try to rescue somebody that may be drowning? They don't just go limp so you can rescue you. What do they do? They try to drown you. It's like a two-for-one special in the water. We're hard to rescue Humans get lost easy, and we get found hard. I suppose God knows all about that, doesn't he? And so did Paul. Colossians is a trail manual for conducting a rescue mission. Most of what the church at Colossae actually knows is good and right, but too much of what they're learning is wrong dead wrong they're increasingly trusting in their own instincts and not the trail guide i want to tell you christian people you want to get in some big problems start trusting your own instincts more than you do the word of god and you'll end up in a bad place if the people in colasse were unable to separate the truth they had from the lies that had somehow mixed in. And if they were unwilling to be rescued, the results could be catastrophic. I think it's fair to say that we've all been lost in one way or the other throughout our lives. And I think it's fair to say that we all know that lost people are difficult to rescue. They're just hard to rescue. You ever tried to intervene into somebody who was really, really, really lost. They were literally on a highway to hell. They were self-destructing. You'd think they'd be easy to save, wouldn't you? These are some of the hardest people to save of all. You see, if we're gonna be saved, we're gonna have to be willing to be rescued. We're gonna have to be willing to be rescued. And if God's going to do his work in us, we have to be willing to allow God to take all those things in us that do not resemble Christ. Welcome back to our verse-by-verse study of the book of Colossians. I'm calling the series Reign of Freedom. Tonight, we're going to take our first steps on the trail. This is unprecedented. In week two, we're already moving. For the next several weeks, we're going to explore this letter. In doing so, we're going to boldly proclaim that the only path to true freedom is found in submitting to the rule and reign of Jesus Christ. Jesus is not a trail that leads to God. Jesus is the trail that leads to God. Now, last week, we placed the letter in historical, geographical, and theological context. And if you missed that, you may want to go back and and catch that on one of our online platforms. But I I feel like we got enough to get started. I do, I just feel like we got enough to get started. So we're going to pick up the rest on the way. So let's grab our backpacks and let's go. Verse one, this letter is from Paul, chosen by the will of God to be an apostle of Jesus Christ and from our brother Timothy. I know what you're thinking. Surely there's not enough there to talk about. Oh, you are so wrong. (laughs) Some New Testament letters were circular in nature. 
They were intended for a general audience. They were to be passed from church to church. This letter is not that. It's written to a very specific audience, the Christians in Colossae. It addresses challenges that were unique to them. And so we're going to get our bearings by sort of unpacking this first verse. It'll introduce us to the greater body of material. First of all, this is the Roman Empire. This is the Roman Empire. In January, I'm sorry, in September of next year, not this September, next September, we're going to be taking a pilgrimage to this part of the world. In fact, our last meeting for people that might be considering going on the pilgrimage will be on September 24th at 3 o'clock here at the church. So if you're considering making this trip, this will be our last kind of recruitment meeting, and after that, we'll start doing some team building. On our trip, we're going to fly into Cappadocia, which is right here, and then we are going to push to the west, and then we will fly to Athens and Corinth. This is generally the pattern of the Bible. It's generally the way the New Testament goes, certainly the way that Paul goes. This is Jerusalem. Jerusalem is the very eastern outpost of the Roman Empire. You have Damascus in Syria, still a city. Uh, Antioch probably had the largest church in the ancient world. We know nothing about it because it, it didn't get a letter in the Bible. Nobody wrote to them. Tarsus is where Paul's from. If you look, this little yellow part is some of the first area that became part of the Roman Empire in 60 BC. So these places have been Roman for a while. Paul then is going to push this direction. He's going to push into this area where we find Colossae. Let's meet Paul. Along with Peter and John, Paul would have been one of the most well-known Christians in his world. He would have been very, very well-known. Saul, originally was called Saul, was a Jew, born around 5 AD. He may not exactly be Jesus' age, but they would have been in high school together. All right? They, they were that close. They would have been within a year or two apart. He was born to an enfranchised family. His family had money. He received the finest higher education available by the renowned rabbi Gamaliel down in Jerusalem. He's an up-and-comer in the temple establishment. He persecuted the earliest Christians. And after his dramatic conversion on the road to Damascus, he changed his name and quickly became the most potent evangelistic force in the history of the world. Paul had a Jewish lung and a Roman gill. That was his brilliance. He had a Jewish lung and a Roman gill. He could live on land and he could live on sea. He fully understood Judaism. He fully understood the Roman Empire and the Greco-Roman culture. And he ushered in an understanding of Christianity that merged the two together and forged something new and exciting. Paul is a major, major factor in Christendom. He's relentless. He's intelligent. He is an interpreter of culture. He's tougher than nails. He's bitten by wanderlust. And he's a religious zealot of the first order. Not only that, he's a Roman citizen. So in the Roman Empire, there were citizens and there were everybody else. He was the top of that. He's not born in Italy. He's not Roman by birth. He's Jewish by birth, which means his family had enough money to buy a citizenship. And let me tell you, those were not cheap in antiquity. If Roman culture is an immovable pagan object, Paul is an irresistible Christian force. And they just collide over and over and over and over. Altoed, Paul is the perfect first century evangelist. The dude's a mutant. He's the perfect first century evangelist. The church in Colossae would have been known to Paul, 
but they did not know him personally. Paul would have known of them. They would have known Paul, but they wouldn't have known him personally. It is possible that Paul previously knew nothing of this congregation before his imprisonment. And it's equally possible that it could have been part of a church planting strategy to the Lycus River Valley that Paul had put together in prison and then sent someone else out to execute. Regardless, Paul has never visited this church in person. So this introduction of Paul's is going to be a little tricky. It's tricky because Paul knows he needs to get off to a good start with his readers if he's going to be heard. I, I write some, and I, I write... I, my, my thing is, I like to write... The, the publisher said that I write short, punchy books that regular people actually finish. All right? So I don't really write for people who read 47 books a year, right? That's really not my audience. I don't really write for people that read books this big either. That's not my audience. I write, people who read, I write for people who read books about that big who just need something that kind of cracks at it. That's what these letters are. These letters are short, they're punchy, they're written for regular people, and they lean in quick. So when I write, the start is really important. If I don't engage my reader in the first five pages, I'm pretty much done because they won't read page six. I tell writers all the time, it doesn't really matter how good your book is if no one reads it. You gotta get them quick. So Paul, Paul's kind of on a tightrope right here. Kind of on a tightrope. This is essentially a letter of critique from someone you don't know. How would you receive critique from somebody you don't know? I think you never have any idea how that's going to go over, but it generally goes over poorly. And then he says, I was chosen by the will of God. Paul always has a little bit of a chip on his shoulder, and there's always a tiny inferiority complex with Paul. It stems from two things. Number one, he was not one of the twelve. He wasn't one of the 12. So the credentials that would have been enjoyed by Peter and John and Matthew, Matthew doesn't get as much press. Matthew is alive until he's about 64. Matthew is a part of the mix here. So Matthew is around. He doesn't enjoy that type of notoriety. He wasn't one of the 12. He also realizes that his pursuit and arrest of Christians fleeing Jerusalem post-Pentecost and before his conversion and the fact that he was present at the stoning of the early martyr Stephen in Jerusalem was all duly noted. It was just duly noted. He could not have a worse past with the Christians. These were two realities that Paul could never quite shake. And they're also a reminder that God changes people. I've got to tell you something. And I'm going to stand on this corner and preach for just a second. One of the great things we have as traditional Orthodox Christians is that we believe that God changes people. When you believe people can't change, then you've got to say, well, that's just how they are. When you believe that God can change people, it changes everything. And what evidence do I have that God changes people? I bet you I've got more than a few testimonies right in front of me tonight as to the transforming power of God. He says, I was chosen by the will of God to be an apostle of Jesus Christ. Like so many characters in the Old Testament and possibly a few characters in this room, Paul was a scandalous choice by any measure. Ironically, Paul didn't really find Jesus. Jesus found Paul. It would be understandable if Paul had this really bad background and he went in search of Jesus. That is not how it went. Paul had this really bad background and Jesus went in search of him. 
Paul introduces himself to the Colossians as nothing more or less than an apostle of Jesus Christ. That is his calling card to ministry. It's all he has, and it's all he needs. An apostle was part of the leadership model of the early church. What separated this office from other upfront offices like pastors and teachers was that it was tied to a gifting and not a location. Pastors and teachers were localized. They were localized. Apostles were regionalized. Paul could have never served in the office of a pastor when he was incarcerated in Rome. He, it just made him a more effective evangelist. You see, by being forced to think and disciple those around him and to plan and especially to write, Paul's incarceration just multiplied his potential in ministry as an apostle. So why was Paul chosen to be an apostle? Because it must have been the will of God. It just must have been the will of God. Why did God choose you? I don't know why God chooses people. Why did God choose me? I don't know why God chooses people. It just must have been the will of God. There's no other explanation. By what authority does Paul speak into the lives of the people at Colossae? Apostolic authority. That's what he's leaning into. And then he says, Timothy is with me. Timothy must have been known to the Colossians, or there would have been no need to mention him. Paul's pretty strategic. Additionally, Paul may be positioning Timothy to be his spiritual successor if things go bad. On Paul's second missionary journey, he was heading west, and he stopped to visit the churches that he started in Derby and Lystra five years prior. It was there he met young Timothy. And Timothy summarily joined the team. But Timothy, despite a sterling reputation, presented a unique challenge to Paul. Though his mother and grandmother were devout Jews, his father was Greek, and Timothy was uncircumcised. He was uncircumcised. Though Paul had recently won a ruling from the Jerusalem Council, basically stating Gentile Christians didn't have to be circumcised, there was a problem that persisted because Paul's evangelism strategy at this point was still begin in the Jewish synagogues. So he needed Timothy on the team as a Jew, not a Gentile. Timothy was circumcised and he joined the team. Young Timothy was really important. It represented Paul's opportunity to carry the gospel of Christ to a new generation. And it represented an opportunity to carry the gospel beyond the decreasingly friendly confines of Judaism. Timothy enhanced the ability of the team to speak to both Jewish and Greek cultures because that's exactly how he had been raised. And his addition was a strategic part of continuing the Christian movement beyond Judaism into the future. Then as now, if you don't have young leaders, you may have a past and a present, but you don't have a future. So here's what I want to say. Be patient with young leaders. Be patient with young leaders. Don't compare them to seasoned and older leaders. Because even seasoned and older leaders could not be compared to themselves when they were young leaders. We must be patient with young leaders. We must pour in to young leaders. We must invest in young leaders because if we don't, we don't have a future. Timothy represented the future and Paul was giving him high commendation to the church at Colossae. Do not criticize. Do not drive young leaders out of ministry. Speak into their lives Love them, support them, gently correct them if they need it. But we need young leaders to become seasoned leaders so that we'll have a future. If you are young, meaning younger than me, which is increasingly most of the American population, if you're young and God's calling you, that's something you need to talk about. 
something you need to look into. What does that look like? Uh, is that bivocational? Is it, bi- is it vocational? These are really important things. We need young Christian leaders today. We need principled young Christian leaders. So guys, would you just pray for young leaders? And the young leaders we have, you know, we have some really good ones. Just love them and support them. Just let them know they're appreciated. And let's help them mature into the godly men and women that Christianity is going to need 20 years from now. I am really high on young leaders, and I think this church has some of the best young leaders out there. Verse 2. Oh, yeah, we're already at verse 2. We are writing to God's holy people in the city of Colossae, who are faithful brothers and sisters in Christ. May God our Father give you grace and peace. Holy people. Holy means to be set apart, sacred. Something sacred is unlike ordinary things. The Greek word literally means to take a bolt of cloth and to cut a small piece out. That piece that is removed from the cloth is holy. I want you to imagine that Paul has a cloak, all right? Back in those days, people wore a cloak. So Paul has a cloak, and let's say he rips the cloak, and he goes to a a tailor or a seamstress, and they say, okay, we can repair that. What they would try to do is find a a bolt of, of cloth or woolen something that somewhat matched, and they would cut a piece out, and they would sew it onto the cloak. That patch would be holy, sacred. It was cut out of the ordinary bolt and used for a special purpose. Holy people are people God has taken away from the ordinary and called to a special purpose. The, he is writing to the holy people. There are a lot of people living in Colossae. Paul's not writing to all of them. He's writing to the ones that God has cut out. He's writing to a specially chosen remnant. The Colossians had honored their unique status, first of all, by being faithful to God. They were not flawless, as we're going to later see, but they were faithful. Guys, did you know there's a lot to be said for being faithful? I think one of the most underrated characteristics that it takes for success is just showing up say well just showing up doesn't make you successful if you don't show up you will fail how's that you don't show up you will fail you will just fail guys he says you guys are faithful you're you're in this man i love it that you're here tonight i don't know what's going on in your life i don't know if things are going well or if things are going poorly but you are here tonight and that's a win That is a win. There's faithfulness in just saying, you know what? The word is going to be proclaimed. I need to spend some time in worship. I will be here tonight. That's a win. Faithful. Paul's prayer for them is that both God's grace and God's peace would be present in their life. That was a common Christian greeting. Verse 3. We always pray for you, and we give thanks to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Letting people know you're praying for them is powerful. You may pray for people. You need to tell people that you're praying for them. You need to tell them that. It's powerful. It's powerful for the one who prays, and it's powerful for the recipient of that prayer. Paul is not offering the thoughts that he is about to give off the cuff. He's offering godly counsel that has been thoroughly marinated in prayer. He additionally writes to people for whom he is thankful. He is truly grateful for this remnant of people. Can you imagine how much better every difficult conversation would go if you opened with this? I pray for you constantly, and I'm truly thankful to God for you. We're going to have to have a talk. Verse 4 and 5. For we have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and your love for all God's people, which comes from your confident hope of what God has reserved for you in heaven. You have had this expectation ever since you first heard the truth of the good news. Guys, it had to feel good to the leaders of an increasingly insignificant place like Colosse that even people in mighty Rome had heard of them. 
Paul wisely offers a resounding commendation on four fronts. And, and I think these are really, really important. This is how he's going to celebrate the church. And these are things that even if you're going through a rough time, even if you're not, you know, just sort of hitting on all cylinders, these are things that God finds very valuable. Number one, faith in Christ. The Colossians are believers. Their faith is in Christ and not human good works. It's not in keeping the ancient law. Faith is the key to the new covenant. And, and the Colossians had faith in good measure. Do you, are you a person of faith? God likes that. God likes that. Number two, love for God's people. You know, we're all filled with something and we all leak. Sometimes the best way to indicate our interior contents is by examining our exterior leakage. The Colossian church leaked love. They loved each other. They just loved each other. They loved and cared about each other. Did they all get along all the time? I doubt it. Did they have some people for whom extra grace was perhaps required properly? They just loved each other. They just loved each other. Had a member of this church who died a few years ago, and sometimes we would go places and uh, didn't always respond terribly well and could be very loud and insensitive and, and downright embarrassing at times. And uh, that happened a few times when I was with this person. And, and one time, they just really had a bad episode. <laughs> and somebody was very put out with them. And, and I don't necessarily blame them. And that person looked at me and they said, Are, is this person with you? And I looked at him. <laughs> I said, yeah, they're one of ours. <laughs> yeah, they're, they're one of ours. It's kind of like when your dog poops in the living room. It really is not great, but it is your dog. Yeah, they're just one of ours. They, that's how the Colossians were. They just loved each other. Are we all perfect? No. You know, is this guy not great? Yeah, it's terrible, but yeah, they're, they're, he's one of ours. <laughs> one of ours. Love for each other. Number three, confident hope. I just call this holy optimism. The church was not down in the dumps because their city was in decline. They're not sitting around pining about the good old days. They had joy in their hearts and pep in their step and a song on their lips. I love the adage, I can't wait until tomorrow because I get better looking every day. Additionally, their hope was based on what God had waiting for them in heaven, not the things on earth. They were storing their hope. They were storing their treasures in heaven. And Paul, and, and Paul said, yeah, good for you. And then number four, they have sustained expectation. This is not just gutting it out. This isn't that kind of endurance where you just kind of gut it out. It's pushing through adversity in full expectation of a good outcome. It's refusing to give in and give up or lose sight of the ultimate goal. It's an absolute confidence that if you do the right things the right way, you'll get the right results in the right time. Such endurance requires a true desire to get better, a true desire to grow in Christ. And Paul is counting on this quality in the Colossians if they are going to give him a hearing. He's counting on that. Verse 6, the same good news that came to you is going out all over the world. It's bearing fruit everywhere by changing lives, just as it changed your lives from the day you first heard and understand the truth about God's wonderful grace. So what's the good news? What is the truth about God's wonderful grace? In its simplest form, the good news is forgiveness of sin and being made right with God through faith in Jesus Christ. That is the gospel message. It's that simple. This compelling message is driving the Christian movement. And people aren't just converting and being baptized. They're experiencing changed lives. Just as their lives were being transformed by the gospel, God is using the Colossians to change the lives of others. Is God moving in a church? Show me changed lives. And it testifies to the movement of God. The Colossians also have acquired baggage, a significant amount of baggage. Think of the church as a mountain hiker whose backpack is filled with all the right equipment, 
but also contains a lot of heavy, unnecessary, and unhelpful things as well. In this letter, Paul is going to attempt to separate what is distinctly good news from the cacophony of beliefs and heresies that the Colossians have seemed to pick up from the larger culture. It's not that everything the Colossians believe is effectively spreading the gospel. It's that part of what they believe that's actually the good news that Jesus is still blessing and moving forward. Aren't you glad you don't have to completely get everything right for God to use you? But we do need to get the gospel right. Correct belief, orthodoxy, bears fruit, converts, and changes lives, makes disciples. Paul seems to have little doubt that the gospel arrived in Colossae in good condition. The roots are good. Everything they need is still in the backpack. They just got a lot of extra stuff too. You may have everything you need in your backpack, but you may have a lot of extra stuff too. And some of that stuff maybe needs to be left behind. And if it does, Colossians is gonna be a wonderful, wonderful journey for you. You may exit the trail in Colossians a lot lighter than you went in. Paul needs to get the bad stuff out of the backpack, keep the good stuff in. All right, closing metaphor. When I lived in the suburbs, I had a yard that I slowly turned into a beautiful lawn over the decade that we lived there. By the time we moved, our lawn on Cedarwood was golf course gorgeous. It was absolutely beautiful. At the cabin where I live now, we have a field that I have failed to even turn into a yard, but I digress. Despite my near-perfect lawn in the suburbs, about this time of year, those late summer weeds would start showing up. And to use old English, they vexed me greatly. <laughs> right? In the same way that gophers vexed Bill Murray's character in the Caddyshack. They vexed me greatly. One year, I decided to take decisive action, as I am prone to do, and I purchased a product that promised to kill all the weeds without harming the lawn. It was also rumored to kill people, but since I was going to spray it and not drink it, I felt like I'd be okay. The directions said to spray directly on the weeds, and the grass around the weeds would not be affected. And I'm guessing that would have been true had I purchased the right product. Apparently, I purchased something akin to Agent Orange. What I had killed everything it touched, and several things it didn't touch. And that late summer and fall, there were dozens and dozens and dozens of brown spots all over my yard where I had sprayed this stuff on weeds. It was all over. My yard looked like a green Dalmatian. I seriously thought about spray painting all the dead patches green. But that seemed like cheating. Somebody's walking their dog one day. And they saw all of the patches. And they said, what happened? And I looked at them and I said, this unfortunate situation was caused by human error. And I, my friend, am the human. <laughs> I'm a firm believer sometimes in life, you just got to wear it. Can I just hear an amen for somebody? Sometimes in life, you just got to wear it. Paul needed to kill the Colossian weeds without damaging the lawn. He needed to get the weeds out, the heresies out, the Gnosticism out without damaging the good news of Christ. It's a delicate business. So if we think of ourselves as spiritual lawns, I would guess we all have some unique combination of good grass and weeds, right? We, we probably have some unique combination. The challenge as we grow in Christ is to get more grass growing and get more weeds out. We need to turn our fields into yards and our yards into lawns. Perhaps becoming a saint is the process of turning a field into a lawn, and it just takes a while. Through prayer, worship, giving, service, and witness, we strengthen our grass content on one hand, and through obedience to biblical teaching and God pings, we allow Christ to pull out the weeds on the other. Pulling weeds isn't any fun. It's painstaking work, makes your back hurt. The lawn usually doesn't look immediately better after you're done. 
But it's absolutely necessary work because pulling out the weeds rescues the grass. Hear me. Pulling out the weeds rescues the grass. To close this session tonight, I wrote a profound prayer this afternoon. It's very complex and deep, so you're going to need to lean in. Almighty God, plant your seeds and pull our weeds. And all God's people said, amen. Father, thank you for this time together tonight. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your word. I pray that you would help us to take that word out into the world this week. Bless us this week and help us to um, just show your love to all those we encounter this week. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Go in peace. Peace.